questions. Um, I like to start actually in the Word of God, uh, Colossians chapter two, uh, verse six. Actually, verse eight says this: "See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy of empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elementary spirits of this world, and not according." To Christ. Let's pray and get started. Dear Heavenly Father God, um, Lord, I pray that this, this verse is true for us, Lord, that uh, no one takes us captive by um, philosophies that really come from Satan himself, the elementary spirits of this world, Lord, worldly philosophies and ideologies, Lord. I pray that we are... Um, we are taking our thoughts captive, Lord. I hear that word captive again and think of war language, Lord. I pray that we understand as Christians, as the church, Lord, that we're in hostile territory. This world is um, not uh, our home. And uh, Lord, that we truly are at war and we need to put on the whole armor of God. And uh, the schemes of the devil, Lord, are, are false ideologies and lies, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, as we go through this class, as we talk about postmodernism today, Lord, that we um, can uh, open our eyes to some of these lies that have been out there for, for a long time now, Lord. So be with us uh, today. Um, I just thank you uh, uh, for this class, Lord. I pray that you help me speak clearly and that the Spirit would open up our minds to just understand these uh, um, uh, deep thoughts, Lord, um, these, these lies and false truths, Lord. In your Son's name, amen. Um, today we're going to be going over part one. I said there's five parts to this class. That doesn't mean we'll finish this part today. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through part one, part two, part three uh, of this class. But today we're going to be going through part one, which is just postmodernism. Um, last week we had an introduction to this course, and really that's all it was. And I just want to be clear on that. I think there was some confusion just talking with some people. We spent most of our time last week talking about racism from a biblical worldview, justice from a biblical worldview. I really didn't spend much time, and I know I went through it quickly, um, talking about the social justice worldview. I just wanted to make sure we started on truth and, and make it very clear that racism is evil and that we should be all about justice, but biblical justice and what the Bible defines as racism, not what this new definition of racism and justice is. Um, the next however weeks it takes to get to these next five parts, we will be zeroing in on this false ideology. And so we'll be talking about exactly what this false ideology believes. Um, today, again, we're going to start that, uh, that um, understanding of the social justice ideologies. Remember what I said last week, I, I hope you remember that. Um, I really believe uh, from my studying, and, and, and again, I didn't make this up. I've uh, read people that are way smarter than me that have um, a better understanding than I do, um, that the social justice movement and the social uh, justice ideologies are really two different ideologies that have come together, that have combined together. And the two ideologies are postmodernism and critical theory, or neo-Marxism, critical or uh, cultural Marxism. Those are terms that you've probably heard a lot in the last um, few years. Uh, so postmodernism and critical theory have come together within the last, and it's probably the 80s and 90s, but it really kind of came to the front of everything, obviously, in 2020. Um, there's no, when, when these movements happen, there's, as we'll see today, there's no like date you usually can put your finger on saying, hey, this is when everything shifted. It's kind of a slow thing, and when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to judge how much it shifted, what it shifted to, what it shifted away from. It's a lot easier to look back and go, oh, yeah, this was this, and this was this, and this was this. We're right in the middle of a shift right now, but it's really these two ideologies, postmodernism and, again, critical theory that have come together um, to really make a religion, and I'm going to say that boldly. Um, I think it's a, a religion of secular society. It acts just like a religion. Um, I said last week, it even excommunicates, right? If you don't follow along with the line of what is being said, you get canceled. Right? You get kicked out of the, the club. You get excommunicated. Um, so it's, it's very much like a religion. Um, again, the names that have been used out there, the social justice ideologies, uh, 
Wokeism is a popular name that's getting used a lot um, to describe this whole thing. Uh, cultural Marxism, uh, neo-Marxism. There's reasons why I don't like it. They're, those aren't my favorite titles. My favorite title so far, and I could change on this at some point, is Applied Postmodernism. And I like that because it's postmodernism with feet. Postmodernism with, with a foundation. As we're going to see postmodernism, classical postmodernism, has no foundation whatsoever. This new movement has a foundation. Right? It has objective truth um, that it's claiming. Right? It's not true truth, but they claim objective truth. And we'll see what that means in a second here. So today, we're going to start part one of this class, and um, that's just postmodernism. Uh, next, maybe not next week, it depends on how far we get in this, but next part will be critical theory, and my guess is that what mo that is what most of you are here for, is to, to understand critical theory. Um, uh, we'll look at the, the history of Hegelianism, Marxism, neo-Marxism, and cultural Marxism, and, and what we have today. We'll go through that whole thing and, and really get our mind wrapped around what critical theory is. And again, I think that's why most of you are here to understand that, but I really think, and just from, from my study and understanding, I really think it's really, really important to understand postmodernism before we get there. And um, so we're going to spend time today looking at postmodernism, and this is going to be deeply historical and philosophical. And so I just want to give you a warning and a disclaimer. I am neither a historian or a philosopher. I have, a, at least by education, I have a BA in biblical studies and I have an MDiv, um, Masters of Divinity, but uh, um, I'm more a, a philosopher by hobby and necessity. Um, necessity as a faithful pastor. And I went over this and I'm going to keep going over this, this verse because I think it's so important that we understand this as a church. Because this is the job of a pastor, Titus 1.9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. That's what my degree's in. My degree's is to be able to teach scripture well, sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That means false ideologies, I mean false philosophies, um, and to rebuke them, we must understand them. So that means I must understand them and do my best to explain it to the church. That's my calling. And so that's why we're here. So what is postmodernism? That question is a really challenging question. Postmodernism is extremely hard to define. It's one of those things that when you see it, you know it, but it's hard to define it. Um, and there's a reason it's hard to define. It's, it's by nature anti-definition. Like, postmodernism does not like definitions. So um, this is not up here because I think Zach stole it. But Zach, are you here? I'm blaming you. He's the one that's in charge of all your child care, so don't, don't pick on him too much. Um, Zach, I think Zach stole it, but, uh, but this comes from The Truth War by um, John uh, MacArthur, and I think his description of postmodernism is one of the best descriptions just in the, the first chapter or two in that book um, that I've read. And uh, this is what he says about uh, the tools that are used by, by postmodernism. The tools, the chief tools employed by postmodernism are relativism, uh, subjectivism, and these are things that we've seen for a long time in our culture, right? Relativism, subjectivism, the denial of every dogma. Okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to ask you as we go through postmodernism to examine your own heart and be truthful with yourself and ask yourself, how much has postmodernism affected me as a Christian? And that's going to be important by going through this first part because it's affected you. I can almost guarantee it more than you realize. Right? It's a fight every day that I go, okay, how much is ideologies out there affecting me and not just scripture? Okay? And so the, reject, the denial of every dogma, the uh, dissection and the annihilation of every clear definition, let me stop there, it's anti-definition. It doesn't want to be defined. Postmodernism doesn't want to be fine. I, I meet people all the time that say, don't define me. Right, uh, I see. I see pastors that that pastor churches that don't want to be called pastors. Why? Because they don't want to be defined by anything. That's influenced by postmodernism, anti-definition, the relentless questioning of axioms, the undue exaltation of mystery and paradox, the deliberate exaggeration, of every ambiguity, um, and above all, the cultivation of uncertainty about everything uncertainty about everything. Because postmodernism is, that's the definition John MacArthur gives, but because postmodernism doesn't like definitions, um, it's defined by what it isn't. I mean, think about it, postmodernism. 
Right? Postmodernism means past modernism, on the other side of modernism, or better yet, not modernism. So it's defined by what it's not because it doesn't like definition. So it's really hard to define postmodernism. Therefore, really to understand postmodernism, you need to understand modernism. So you can say, I know this, now it's not that. <laughs> So what is modernism? Just real quick, in the history of Western civilization, there's been really four major time periods, and this is very roundabout. Because again, when a movement happens, it's hard to just pick a date to say, hey, this is when that movement happened. Um, when you look back, you kind of try to do that. But first, in Western civilization, we have antiquity, which is ancient Greece and Roman, really paganism. Um, and that's B.C. something to about 300 A.D. Again, roundabout numbers. There's arguments on this. Um, that's antiquity. You move from antiquity to the Middle Ages, which is around 300 A.D. to about 1700 A.D. Again, around about, people argue, by hundreds of years where that is. That's just my, you know, right there. We, we leave the Middle Ages to a modern age in around 1700 AD to the 1960s. It's a little bit easier. It gets a little bit more specific as we get closer because we saw some of these transitions that happen. And I'm just throwing out the 1960s because a lot of cultural shifting happened there. Um, I didn't live through it, but I've just read about it and seen it. So for you guys that have lived it, I'm sure it was an interesting time. It does get me to think, just to give... Just to give hope, I just imagine what churches and people felt like in the 1960s, and it probably felt pretty hopeless then, too, you know, kind of the feeling we're feeling now. Um, uh, I don't know, but the 1960s were a major shift from modern age to really a postmodern age, and you go from the 1960s to, I'm going to say 2020, this is me, I believe we're in a major shift now to an applied postmodern age. And there's a reason why I think that, that you see these like hundreds of years. The Middle Ages were, were over a thousand years. And then I'm saying the postmodernism was like this short period of time. I think there's a reason for that, that postmodernism was never going to survive by its, by its ideologies. So you can't say there is no truth and survive, right? And so something is coming to replace it. Um, again, I don't know what it's called yet. Or even, I have this feeling that historians will look back and they won't separate what's happening right now from postmodernism. Um, I could be wrong on that, but it's different, and this is so important. There's a shift that is happening, and it's different than classical postmodernism, what we've been used to since the 60s. It's different, and I'm going to talk about that today and what, what is different about it. Um, so let's look at these four time periods just real quickly. Antiquity, B.C., something to about 300 A.D. It's just really marked by paganism and especially Greek philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Socrates before them. Um, it was marked by uh, um, paganism and Greek philosophy, and that shifted to the Middle Ages where Christianity kind of took over uh, the Roman Empire. Um, Augustine was a big figure, that, um, but Constantine, all that stuff. So the Middle Ages, um, it's called the Middle Ages because it's between or middle of antiquity and the modern age. And... Uh, um, so ancient Greek and ancient Greek philosophy in the modern age. And, and really, there's a shift that happened in the 1600s, 1700s, where people were looking back to the ancient philosophers, and, uh, and they called it the Middle Ages um, because there was this big interest back into Greek philosophy. So um, in this time period, Christian, Christianity was a dominant religion, okay? um, especially the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the highest authority was God and, and of some sort, okay? This was not perfect. There was a mixture, and this is going to be very simplistic because it was way more complicated than this, but there was this mixture of the highest authority being the Bible, the church, and church tradition, okay? And that caused a lot of problems um, within the, the medieval period or the, the Middle Ages. Um, so what is modernism? We switch from the Middle Ages to, to modernism. Uh, the modern age rejected God as the highest authority. And to be clear, as you read a lot of kind of modern writings, and, and it's not that they rejected God or Christianity. They rejected God as the highest authority. In fact, a lot of modern philosophers and, and writers really had high regard for Christianity, Bible, and God. 
It's just they rejected God as the highest authority. Okay, and that confuses us a lot of times because we'll read people, philosophers that you think are kind of anti-Christian. You're like, how is this guy? He seems like he loves God and loves the church and loves the Bible. It's not that he's rejected God. He's rejected God as the highest authority. And in doing so, he's rejected God, and we see what comes out of that. But, but that, that, let me just make that clear. He's rejected God as the highest authority. Man's autonomous reasoning became the highest authority. Okay? Not man's reason, but autonomous reasoning is separated from revelation became the highest authority. Um, by reasoning, I, I really mean empiricism or empirical observations. If you took the apologetics class, you know exactly what that is. If you didn't, that's just your five senses. So observational science kind of deal. Um, and reason, logic, those two things together is kind of the middle age, or the, the modern age saw that as the highest authority and scripture and the church was underneath that. Okay. Modernism simply, in simple terms, was characterized by the belief that truth exists. This is so important. Truth exists, and it was outside of man. It was out there somewhere. And it's going to be found by a combination of empirical observation and reason. Okay. Um, again, truth is out there. If you ever watched the X-Files in the beginning, it says truth is out there. Like The thought was that truth is out there, and we need to explore a lot of exploration, a lot of discovery in, in the modern period, right? In modernity, again, God's revelation was no longer the higher arbitrary of what is truth, arbiter of what is truth. Reason alone became the highest authority, right? And reason became a higher authority than scripture. Um, so, and we could just spend so much time talking about that, but Let's just keep going. Um, one of the major tenets of modern age, again, to understand postmodernism, we need to understand the modern age. One of the major tenets of the modern age was optimism. Right? It was a very optimistic age. The Enlightenment was a very optimistic time. And there was a couple of reasons for this. First, man had finally escaped what they thought the dogmas of the church. Uh, the centuries, and especially the Roman Catholic Church, the centuries leading up to the 16th century, which really led to the Reformation, there was major corruption in the Catholic Church. And um, there are scandals, ugly schisms, wars, persecution done in the name of the church. And there was this unholy relationship between the, the Catholic Church and the state. Okay? And, and so man really just believed that it escaped all this ugliness, the dogmas of, of religion. Now, obviously, um, I'm a fan of religion and Christianity and the Bible, uh, but but there was this feeling that the um, the corruption in the church needed to be escaped from. And that's actually where it led to the Reformation and Protestants, and and we come from that that history. So so the first thing, why the optimism? And we can talk more about that later. But a man had finally escaped the dogmas of religion. But secondly, we were making incredible scientific discoveries. We had this very hopeful future. Like we we're just, I mean, if you look at, at the change that happened in the uh, 1700s and on, um, just massive uh, ch uh, change in discoveries and scientific discoveries. A third reason why it was a very optimistic time is modern medicine was advancing. Man was living longer. Uh, a fourth reason was just the United States. The United States came into existence. There was this hope of freedom, a just society, right? this perfect civilization. Um, and fifth, belief that reason, and this is super important, belief that reason would end all conflicts. We just need to educate people and, and conflicts would end. Right? There was this thought that reason would, would end all conflicts. It was a very optimistic time. Man thought modern medicine would sol solve all ailments, education would end all wars, and man reason would save us from all conflict. And it, really, man's reason became savior. This was true all the way up to about 1914, when World War I cracked that optimism. Right? Now, it didn't destroy it, but it cracked it, it's why World War I is called the war to end all wars. It was not just because it was so big. That's part of the reason why it was a war to end all wars. But there was still this optimism, this thought that this was the last war, the last major conflict that, that Western civilization will ever have because we're a modern society. Well, that, that was completely destroyed <laughs> with World War II and the Holocaust and the horrors of communism 
millions and millions and millions dead. The bloodiest century we've ever seen in this modern age. After World War II, this is so important to understand where we are as a culture, the optimism of modernism was completely destroyed. World War II really just threw us into a postmodern culture. And just think of the 60s, right? And what they were anti in that time. It became a very pessimistic by nature and even cynical. So let me just ask this question. How many of you guys have seen the, the movie? Um, you may not want to raise your hand because I think it's rated R, the second one at least. They both might be, so just you can answer this in your heart so you don't embarrass yourself. Um, how many of you guys have seen the movie 310 to Yuma? You guys might be asking, well, which one? Right? There's two of them, right? 310 to Yuma, the cowboy movie, right? The, right, 310 to Yuma, is that right? Did I say it wrong? Yeah, I said it right? Okay, good. Um, there's two movies, and I just caught maybe as I was, I've, I've, I saw the, the one in, in, there's one in 1950 that was made, and there was one in 2007 that was made, and I saw the one in 2007, and then um, I watched the one in 1950, and I just was like amazed at how actually similar these movies were. Like the, the remake, they copied the first one, like, almost exactly uh, the feel and everything besides the ending. The endings were completely different. And it really bothered me. I thought about it. You can watch it on YouTube. Again, let me warn you, the rated R, and especially the 2007, is really gory, so throwing that out there. But um, in the 1950 version, let me just uh, tell you what happens. The husband, spoiler alert, but whatever. Um, the husband, who's this good guy, right, and has his family, um, the honorable, the guy that wants to do what's right and just, gets this bad guy who this bad guy was known to be a really bad guy <laughs> on this train. And the bad guys, they're, they're making this the train to Yuma. As they're making this trip to the train, starts to really admire the good guy and, and for his courage and his sense of justice because the bad guy's gain was coming after the good guy. And this guy wasn't like a gunslinger or anything. He was just a normal farmer and he was... You know, I'm taking the train, I don't care. And um, he admires him, so at the very end, he helps him get on the train. The bad guy actually helps the good guy get on the train to take him to prison, you know, uh, because he admires him. And justice prevails, goodness wins. It's like the train goes off into the sunset. The wife's there waving as they're going. Very optimistic ending. It's this modern ending. You get to the 2007 version, right? And again, first of all, it's gory, and that just tells you something about our culture anyways. Um, the bad guys, so they, they're like going to make this movie exactly like the old movie besides the ending. They can't end it that way. So the bad guy, right, gets on the train, and you see the same exact thing. He starts admir admiring the good guy for his, his sense of justice and his courage, and um, he gets on the train, and as the good guy's about to get on the train too, like, the good guy gets shot in the back by the bad guy's gang in front of his son. Right? And then the bad guy who's on the train that was admiring this guy, gets so upset, he jumps off the train and just shoots everyone. <laughs> a massive tragedy. Very pessimistic. In fact, the line between good and evil is so blurred in this movie, and one of the tenets of postmodernism is blurring lines. Right? This bad guy is about as bad as it gets. He just shoots everyone, but he's also a good guy because he loved the good guy. Like, there's this conflict, Right? This is a postmodern ending. What happened between these two movies, 1950 and 2007? The 60s. And there's a shift in our culture. And so it's very obvious in, in, those, in those movies, there's something I've noticed. Uh, we became a postmodern culture. To a, a postmodernist, modernity, or modernity led to ideologies such as Marxism, fascism, and communism ideologies that have killed millions and millions and millions in the 20th century. What's ironic is now they're adopting Marxism, and we'll talk about that. But at first, in the 60s, it was, it was, there was a lot of anti-Marxism, there was a lot of all these modern ideologies. Um, modernity led to, ma or they, they believed modernity, modern age, led to massive pollution, Right, postmodernists believe this, uh, destruction of the rainforest. I mean, we've heard all of these things, right? Extinction of animals because of our modern technology and stuff. Threat to the ecosystem. Um, modernity also led to war technology. Right? It was supposed to end wars, and we get to World War I and then World War II, and there's all these brand new ways of killing each other. 
the nuclear bomb. And again, reason and sciences was supposed to end all wars. Instead, it gave, it gave man the power just to destroy everything on earth. So these are some of the reasons for this cultural shift in the 60s. Again, there's much more than that, but we shifted from a, a modern culture to a postmodern culture. So the question is, what is postmodernism? Well, it's not modernism. It's pessimistic in, in culture and science. It's skeptical of modern medicine and reason. Right? It's cynical towards all objective truth claims. Again, I want you to, to question your heart. Like, has this affected me? It's, it's cynical towards anyone that says this is truth. Thus says the Lord, right? So here, let me, we're going to go through nine tenets, and I don't think we're going to get through them all today. But half hour, I think we'll get through most of them. We'll, we'll try to shoot for, for all of them. But nine tenets of postmodernism. Now they kind of know the history and kind of how we got to a postmodern part of an age. Let's just look at some of the characteristics of a postmodern. I got nine of them of a postmodern age. And so a lot of this should be pretty pretty familiar because a shift happened in 2020, but we've been a postmodern age for my whole life. So a lot of these should be familiar. The first tenet is this, radical skepticism or radically skeptical. Skeptical of any and all objective truth claims. Okay. Modernists believe that truth was out there, remember? Truth was out there. It was knowable. It was objective. It, it will save us even. We just got to discover it. Postmodernism says that objective truth is not knowable. It's a fool's errand to go look for objective truth outside of us somewhere. Therefore, all truth is just relative to the individual. It's equal. So we can't measure what truth is more true. It's just equal. All truth is equal. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Have you ever seen the coexist bumper sticker? That's just saying all religions are equal. There's not one that's closer to the truth or not. How could we know? All roads lead to God. All truth claims are equal. So that's the first tenet, radical, uh, skept or radical skepticism. The second tenet is this. Certainty is seen as arrogant. Certainty is seen as arrogant. Again, check your heart on this. To be, to be certain about something is seen as arrogant. We've even changed our language. Right? We qualify all truth claims in our culture with these words. I think, I believe, I feel. Instead of just saying, it is, we say, I think, I believe, I feel. It's like, it's hard for us to say a truth claim without, without saying, I think, I believe, I feel. Right? When you say that, you're saying, well, this is just my truth. Your truth can be different. Right? Instead of truth is outside of us. Um, in fact, um, again, certainty is seen as arrogant. If you don't preface it with, I think, I feel, I believe, if I say there is a God and you'll go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as son, that's seen as arrogant. Instead of going, is that true or not? I think it would be fair to ask that question if you, if you don't believe. Um, in fact, I taught a class here at HOS, the school here at Country Oaks, and uh, here at our little conservative school, right, the, the seniors and juniors that have been taught about postmodernism and everything. And, and I took a class here, and they would have to write papers. And I said, if I see the word, I think, I feel, I believe in the paper at all, you get an F. It's automatic F. And it was so hard for them not to put, I think, I believe, I feel. I'm like, well, we're talking about the Trinity. I don't care what you think, believe, or feel. I care about what God's word says. I care about truth. So, so preface it with the word God says. And if it's wrong, I'll tell you, and then we'll like kind of work it out. <laughs> but I don't care what you think, you believe, or you feel. I mean, like I do because I care about you, but, but not when it comes to truth. Just think about it and think about, listen to people and how they talk and how you talk. When you talk to your friends about Christianity, do you think, go, well, I think. Or do you proclaim it like the apostles did? Thus says the Lord. Right? Repent. They didn't say, well, I think. <laughs> In fact, none of the prophets did, right? Anyways, get off my... Anyway. Uh, in a postmodern culture, again, it's arrogant to, to be certain. Humility is always found in uncertainty. And I want to spend some time in here because I don't think it's, hum it's humble. Right? Humility, supposedly, is always found in uncertainty. So let me give you an analogy. Postmodern is... I still got batteries. I... Okay, I'm going to keep going. 
Uh, postmodernists like to say religion is like, you, probably, you may have heard this, I've said this in the apologetics class, but um, I'm going to say it again. Religion is like four blind men filling different parts of an elephant arguing about what it is. You have someone that's filling a trunk saying with certainty, it's long, skinny, like a hose, and he's arguing with everyone else, right? And then you have another blind man that's filling the feet, and they're saying, well, it's flat and stable, right? And you have another blind man saying, no, no, you both are wrong. He's filling uh, the legs, and he's saying it's long and muscular. And you have a fourth blind man, right, saying, no, you guys are all wrong. You guys are, are crazy. It's long and small and fluffy, <laughs> the tail. A postmodernist, says, a postmodernist would say this is like all faiths, right? All religions give us different pieces of the puzzle, therefore coexist, the bumper sticker, right? We all just have different pieces of the puzzle, so here's my question. Is that really humble? Let me ask this. I mean, think about that analogy, the four blind men t- touching the elephant, right? Who's claiming to be able to see? The postmodernist that's watching all this and saying they're all wrong, right? It's not humble. It's actually extremely arrogant. I, I, I'm sorry if you have the post. I don't know everyone in here, so if you have that coexist bumper sticker. It's one of the most arrogant bumper stickers there is out there. You're saying all those religions are wrong and I know it's right. They all just have different pieces of the puzzle, but I get it, right? I'm the one that sees they're all blind. Think about it, right? It's very arrogant to to say that certainty is arrogant (laughs) because to say certainty is arrogant is is certainty (laughs) and it's hypocritical to be certain and then say certainty is arrogant. Do you, do you see that? It, it, it's blind to arrogancy. Like, I don't think people are trying to be arrogant. I don't think people put the coexist. They, they might be, don't get me wrong. But um, I don't think they realize the argument that they're making is arrogant, but it is. Um, just think about, let me just put it in their language. Just think about how arrogant, closed-minded, and hypocritical is the idea behind that coexist bumper sticker. It is saying anyone that claims that there is one way to God is wrong. That's what they're saying. Listen, that's arrogant. Because they're saying the majority of mankind that's ever lived that said there's only one way to God, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, they're saying they're all wrong, and us small little, this little civilization, and few of us, we're right. Very arrogant. So, and we're going to see how that works in Christianity too. So I'm asking you to examine your heart. Um, and they have figured it out. They see, right? They see all the blind men. Who are the blind ones that they're considering blind Christians, Muslims, Mormons, Jews, Catholics, evangelicals? They're blind because they claim certainty. Again, that's arrogant. So let's get to the third tenet. Um, truth is personalized. Okay? This will explain so much, especially when it comes to the LBG T movement. Um, modernists say that truth is outside of us and knowable. Postmodernists say truth is inside of us and relative to the individual. Therefore, when you question someone's truth claim you are seen as attacking them. So when someone says, I'm a girl, when they're obviously a biological guy, and you're going, well, the truth is outside of us, and it's the biology, it's the chromosomes, it's um, uh, the biological sex, and they get super offended, it's because they're postmodernists, and they believe that that truth is inside them, it's their personal truth, and when you say you're wrong, you're not attacking a truth that's outside of them. It, it used to be in modern age, truth was here, there's a guy there, me, and we're arguing about this, that's outside of us, but now truth is personalized, so when I say you're not a girl, you're a guy, they get offended. And I'm like, I'm not trying to offend you, I'm just trying to look at truth. Right? That explains why they get offended, because truth is personalized. All right, fourth tendon of a postmodern culture. Postmodernism is relativistic by nature. I'm sure we've seen this in the last 40, 50, 60 years. I think something like that. Uh, because truth is personalized to the individual, truth is relative to that individual. Even ethics itself is relative, right? 
may be wrong for you, but it's right for me. Premarital sex may be wrong for you. I don't know how many times like I've heard something like this in college. Premarital sex may be wrong for you as a Christian, but, but I don't believe in that. It's not wrong for me. It's relative to the individual. Because again, truth is not outside man, it's inside man. And that's super important to understand our culture. Like, we get frustrated because we keep trying to argue about truth and we're like, no, it's out there. And, and, and that's not how postmodernists believe. They believe it's personal truth. And again, that's affected us. I just examine your heart on that. Um, fifth tenet of postmodernism, it's cynical by nature. Postmodernism is skeptical of all truth claims, but it's also cynical. There's a difference between skepticism and cynical, even though they're related. Cynicism or cynical is believing that a person's motives are, are, are motivated by self-interest. This is important in understanding social justice ideologies as we move forward. Cynicism is an um, inclination to believe that people are motivated purely by self-interest, a form of skepticism, but there's like a cynical nature to it. I'm using the word to define it, but oh well. Uh, modernists, uh, modernists, just so you know, are skeptical. So postmodernists are radically skeptical. Modernists are skeptical. If you, if you see a scientist that is, uh, still kind of holds to a modern moral view that you can find truth out there, they'll say skepti- skepticism is a good tool, right? They'll, they'll say, hey, when we think something is one way, we should be skeptical of that and do experiments and just make sure it's the way that we think. That's how the scientific method works in the modern age. There's a difference though. Postmodernism is radically skeptical and, and even cynical. So they don't think that you can find truth where a modernist believes skepticism can lead to truth. They're just, it's radically skeptical. Okay. You see the difference in that? Um, they're cynical toward, so not just skeptical, but cynical towards science, technology, right? modern medicine, Western values, Western religions. Uh, there's really attracted to, to postmodernist Eastern philosophies, religions, and mysticism. I mean, again, just think of the Beatles, right? attracted to, to Eastern uh, religions, um, attracted to Eastern medicine, Holistic healing, very popular right now in our culture, holistic healing. Um, that became super popular after the 60s, before the 60s. Modern medicine was, you know, everything after the 60s. Like today, we have this skepticism of modern medicine. Okay. Um, again, sixth tenet, six tenet uh, there's an obsession with language, and this will explain so much. There's an obsession with language in postmodernism. In postmodern thought, Language is believed to have enormous power to control society and how we think, and thus inherently dangerous. Let me give you an example. Um, if you use the personal pronoun him or her, that's, that's seen as dangerous and attacking someone, like to the point of like physically attacking them. Um, it, it keeps those who don't identify as him or her oppressed, in other words. There's this obsession with language. Um, since there is no truth, no objective truth that's out there in a postmodern philosophy, to anchor language in, language is ultimately meaningless in a postmodern philosophy. It's only used to oppress people. So that's the only use of language to oppress people. And since discourse or language um, are believed to create and maintain oppression, they have to be careful and they have to carefully modern and deconstruct language. Uh, let me, I'm just interested. How many of you guys have heard of the word deconstructionism? Good. A lot of you. It's a postmodern tool. It's a postmodern, it's a subcategory of postmodernism. Um, it, it's finding the hypocrisy and in, in internal in, um, inconsistencies within language. It's really just, if I can simplify it, it's questioning a discourse, questioning language, questioning, it really becomes anything, questioning anything to death, like just tearing it down. There's no building up and um, that's deconstructionism and it's the name itself. Um, So it's obsession with language. Um, That's why free speech is being attacked in our culture right now. It's a a philosophical ideology that, that, that people truly believe that they, for how much you want to make fun of the college students that look like little wimps that are crying because someone made fun of them, 
Um, it's an ideology that's driving it. The ideology they truly believe language is oppressive. Okay? So a seventh tenet, uh, the blurring of boundaries. And we saw that in the three tend to Yuma, the good and bad are blurred. Like, well, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Who knows? Right, most movies and shows you watch nowadays, it, there's no like clear good guy and clear bad guy. It's not like the 50s and 40s where it's like, that's a good guy, that's a bad guy. <laughs> like, and they're shooting each other and the bad guy wins and goes off into the sunset. Um, any boundary that is widely accepted as true must be questioned and blurred in a postmodern society. Let me just give you five examples of this. Again, just this affects everything. Uh, premarital sex is wrong. That was sexual revolution, blurred that boundary. Right? Just think of the 60s. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Those used to be clear boundaries in our culture. Right? Those boundaries are, are completely blurred. Uh, there are only two genders. Biological men should be attracted to biological women. Being overweight is unhealthy. Right now that's called fat shaming. Right? You're like, well, it's just, I'm just looking at scientific facts. You know, I'm not trying to attack anyone. No, you are. And there's this blurring of boundaries, like blurring of clear um, thoughts. All these commonly held beliefs and boundaries should be what the postmodern ideology would call problem, or problematized, in other words, blurred. Yeah? Yeah, so you're jumping ahead, and you're, I, I love you for it. Uh, this is why classical postmodernism has shifted to something different. There's a major shift that's happened, and we're going to talk about that. But to understand the shift, you need to understand postmodernism because it still influences, it's so very influential in this new shift that happens. So that's a major one, right? And we'll get there. I don't want to jump ahead, but yeah, yes, I'll just say that. Um, an eighth tenet to postmodernism, again, we're talking about classical postmodernism here. It prefers, this is a big one, it prefers narrative to truth and facts. I mean... You see this everywhere. <laughs> we like watch the news. They have got rid of fact finding. It's all about narrative. Um, everything is seen through the lens of narrative or story. Postmodernism uh, detests propositional truths. In other words, straightforward facts or um, axioms. Uh, people instead argue or people make arguments through narrative, not with facts. Okay, again, just watch the news. It's like we went from, from giving the facts to it's all about personal stories, like this person died or, or this thing happened, and, and they, these sob stories of what's happening, and some of them are really sad stories, don't get me wrong, but, but it's about narrative, not facts. What's a narrative? Well, Scott Allen, he's the one that wrote um, that top one, uh, the one that I suggest why social justice is not, or why biblical justice, wait, no, why social justice is not biblical justice. I've been saying that backwards. Anyways, um, he says this, but he says this in his other book, A Toxic New Religion. Uh, he says this, a few years ago, people didn't use the word narrative as we do today. Rather, they used the word propaganda, willfully misleading people to further a particular agenda. And you got to think how this works in postmodernism. Right? They don't believe in ultimate truth that's outside of us. So facts are pointless. So what do you do? You, you, you purposely lead people a certain direction, and they do that through narrative. Let me give just four important characteristics of narrative. Again, this comes from Scott Allen, A Toxic New Religion. Four characteristics of, um, of narrative. Yeah, the first one is this. Narratives are stories. That's simple. Right? Narratives are stories. Let me just read what he says. They tend to be compelling easy to grasp moral tales. They lean toward bold, simple plot lines. Good and evil are clearly defined. They are uh, carefully crafted um, characters, heroes, villains, and victims. Again, it's ironic because they want to blur the lines, but when, when, when you use narrative, you have these clear, like, good and bad, and he's evil, and he's good, and he's the victim, and he's the oppressor. And let me just give you an example of a, of a narrative, the Mike Brown case. In 2014, is what started the BLM, the whole hands up, don't shoot, which just didn't happen. Like all the facts, you look at it. He never said, he never put his hands up. He never said, don't shoot. Right? But the villain was the cop. 
The victim was Mike Brown. The heroes are the activists. And there's absolutely no room for nuance. So it's ironic, again, because this worldview is all about nuance, but not when it's driving a narrative. Okay. Let me give you a second characteristic of narrative. Narratives are tools used to accomplish political, social, or cultural objectives. Right? This is a tool that postmodernists use. They are employed, by, um, or employed to exist, influence, and shape policy and culture Name any major issue of the day, global warming, LGBT rights, race, a particular foreign policy, and for each one, narrative has been carefully crafted, promoted, and protected in order to advance a, politi- or a particular agenda. Okay. Third characteristic of narrative, narratives work through distortion. Okay, narratives work through distortion. While portrayed as true, They convey a highly distorted and ultimately false picture. They don't care about facts. And again, because they don't care about truth. That's a postmodern ideology. They only care about driving belief a certain direction. Um, Distortion works by focusing on a particular aspect of truth, fact, and evidence while purposely ignoring and suppressing other related facts, evidence that are, are necessary to see the bigger picture. Again, the Mike Brown case is just a great example, and there's plenty of examples like this. You, you had a, a black man shot by a white officer, and like that's the only truth you needed. And the narrative was going to run from there. Right? And the, I mean, the judgment already came before anyone right, had a chance to examine the facts around that case. Um, fourth, narrative works by leverage, leveraging our emotions. So postmodernism is all about feeling, not truth. They appeal to our heart, not our head. Uh, to, to, to our innate sense of justice, of right and wrong. We want them to be true, even if facts and evidence call them into question. This is what makes them so powerful and so dangerous. Narrative is not about communicating truth, in other words. It's about persuading beliefs. So this leads us to a ninth Tenant, um, there's no meta narratives. So it's super ironic, okay? But it makes sense when you really examine this philosophy and this worldview, um, this ideology. I, I hesitate to call it a worldview, but th- that's beside the point. Um, even though everything is seen through personal narrative, okay, that's important, personal narrative, post or personal stories, in other words. Postmodernism, classical postmodernism, and we've changed into applied postmodernism. We'll talk about that. But classical postmodernism uh, adamantly denies a meta narrative. Okay. What's a meta narrative? A meta narrative um, is a universal story that connects all of us and our personal stories. In fact, meta narrative, that word was coined to explain postmodernism. <laughs> Um, so what's a meta narrative? It's like what I did this morning in preaching. I went through the story of scripture and said, this is how we fit into this and this defines us. We're sinners. Right? In Genesis 3, this is how it started. Like the, the Bible is a meta narrative that explains our personal stories. Postmodernism pretty much says there is no meta narrative. You only have personal individual stories. Okay? Postmodern um, there is no, again, objective truth or absolute truth, and there's nothing outside of us that's important that connects us. That's what's led our culture to radical individualism, right? The, the sense that we had before the 1960s of um, national pride and, and, you know, you think of the 40s and all the people that signed up for the military in, in World War II, and um, there's no meta narrative that connects us like it did back then. Right? We only have our individual stories. It's led to radical individualism in our culture. Um, so that, very simply, that's the nine tenets of postmodernism. Postmodernism, if I can just get it into like one sentence, is, is truth is not objective, authoritative, and found outside of us. It's personal, subjective, and found inside of us. Okay? If I can just simply put it, truth is not objective, authoritative and found outside of us. It's personal, subjective, and found inside of us. And this leads to me to one of my favorite books on postmodernism. Like, I, I've shared this with many of you. It's called Mu Ba La La La. Okay. You laugh, but I, 
was kind of reading through this with my daughter a few years ago and go, postmodernism. Okay, so let me just read it to you because I'm, I'm not joking, um, although it's still funny. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it says, cow says moo. For you guys that are up front, if you can see it, what's a cow look like there? Just describe his personality. Sad, I heard. I say sad. Maybe it's a, a combination between sad and mad. You guys are like, what are you talking about? Why a children's book? Just stick with me. Sad, mad. Okay. Uh, the sheep say ba. What about that, the sheep? Okay. I would say simple. It doesn't look sad or mad, but, but very simple, maybe naive. And, and it, you can look at it afterwards. I really believe that that's what it's going for. And then you get to the three seeming pigs that say la, la, la. What do they look like? Very happy. They're dressed. They're having a really good time in life. Let's keep going. No, no. Right? There's not even anyone that's saying this. Right? This is the authority exclamation point. No, no, you say, or that's, um, that isn't right. The pigs say oink all day and night. Now what do they look like? Bored, sad, maybe mad. Okay, let's keep going. Rhinoceros snort and snuff. They are mad for sure. Um, the little dogs go rough, rough, rough. They are very angry too, and they're angry at each other. There's conflict here because of their, who they are and what's going on. Some of the dogs go bow, wow, wow. Right, they don't look happy. Although, when my dog chases a cat. He's pretty happy, I'm just going to say. And that's really important. Right? I, I just want to say that because dogs are happy when they're dogs. You put a dog in the middle of the ocean and say you're a fish, he's not happy. But in this book, dogs chasing cats are really mad. And cats getting chased, and this is probably true, right? And the cats and the kittens say meow, they're not very happy either. Okay. Quack says a duck, he's yelling, in my opinion. A horse says nay, kind of confused. Again, you can look at this and you can tell me if I, I think you're right or not. It's quiet now, what do you say? And the you is underlined. How do you define yourself? Don't let culture or people outside of you or truth outside of you define you. Don't let a meta-narrative of what cows do and pigs do define you. What do you say? The ones that were happy were the ones that did completely different than what pigs do. Right? You know, I, everyone's like, man, you're, well, you've studied this way too much. You're looking way too into this. Um, I've looked up this author. Uh, I th she went to Berkeley, and I think she has a master's degree from Yale. She's not dumb. I don't know if it's the influence that she wrote this or if she's trying to influence, if she knows. I wouldn't be surprised if she had no idea. She's just been around it so much that she wrote this. And, and I've seen a couple of other books, and we read them to our kids that are not bad, um, that I can find. You know, maybe I'm blind to it. But, but again... This is saying that the, the ones that are the happiest are the pigs that are dressed up and dancing. And I tell you right now, if I got a pig and I dressed it up and made it stand on its high legs forever and dance, I don't think he's going to be happy. Right? Because pigs are meant to be pigs. Right? And that's where it finds its happiness. There's truth outside of it. Right? It's not what the pig decides to be. It's not what we decide to be. We need to find our place in society, and that's where we're going to find our happiness, when we truly figure out who we are in, in the meta-narrative of God's word, right, and our place there, and we find grace, um, this is, it, it's truly an attack on Christianity when it comes down to it, um, because the devil is behind this, this ideology. Um, so, let me say this, what is postmodernism good for, as we're getting close to the end here? What is postmodernism good for? It's really good at deconstruction. It's good at being cynical. It's good at questioning everything. It's good at exposing contradictions and hypocrisy. And you know what? Sometimes we need that, to be honest. Uh, maybe we needed to question modern medicine and a few other things more than we did before the 60s. Like, it's really good at questioning. It's really good at tearing down. 
but it's never been good at building up or answering. Therefore, the postmodern worldview was never going anywhere on its own. It was never going to survive. No worldview is going to survive that says you can't know anything for sure. Truth is subjective and relative to the individual. We need to deconstruct everything. All religions are the same. All ways lead to God. There is no meta narrative. There's nothing outside of us that defines us. There's nothing outside of me that defines me that, that connects our stories together. You can't build a worldview off that. That's why I hesitate to call it a worldview. These presuppositions, you can't build a worldview off of. Remember the three roots of a worldview. We talked about this in the apologetics class. You have metaphysics, what is real? What is real? A postmodernist would say we, we don't know. All we have is our personal thoughts within our head and we can't get outside of that. Epistemology, what is knowledge? A postmodernism says we can't know anything for sure. Um, all we have is subjective ideas, subjective personal experiences. In ethics, what is right and wrong? A postmodernist would say moral, morality is relative, therefore destroying morality. Postmodernism, and this is why I spend so much time here, postmodernism left a void in our culture. And that void needed to be filled. And it has been filled. The void has been filled. In fact, it's been filled by critical theory. Okay. And it's a mixture of postmodernism and critical theory. And there's a shift from classical postmodernism to what I call applied postmodernism. And it really became a, a cultural phenomenon, I think, in 19, or 2020. Okay, where it just has been... It's like n the 1960s. Like something there happened. A bunch of things happened. And it just threw through the culture into postmodernism, right? In the 19, or 2020, same thing, right? Maybe it was because of the virus, I don't know. Uh, and maybe because it was George Floyd, I don't know. Um, but there was enough things that happened all at once where it threw us into something different, right? And I think most of us feel it. I think that's why there's 240 people that have signed up for this class. Right? We feel that there's this major shift that's happened. Well, the shift is postmodernism to what I call applied postmodernism, and that's where critical theory comes in. Critical theory, as we'll go over next week, critical theory gave legs to postmodernism. Okay? It gave it a foundation. It gave it ultimate um, truth that's outside of us. It gave us definitions. It gave us identity. Right? All these things that postmodernism has denied and has teared down, critical theory has come and made it possible to be a worldview. It gave it a foundation. And that's one of the reasons God is in control. So when I say this, please don't panic. It's one of the reasons why it's so scary. It's because it's a, it's a worldview that actually can be used. Like it's a worldview that actually makes sense within itself, even though it doesn't make sense as we look at it um, from a, an objective biblical understanding. <laughs> like, but it's a worldview with feet. Postmodernism never had feet. Right? And so that's where we'll go next week. We'll talk about, um, I really wanted to end with four ways postmodernism has affected the church. Um, I'll, de I'll de debate if we start next week with that or if we'll just jump into... Um, critical theory. I'll pray about it and see what I feel led to do. Um, but we're going to talk about critical theory next week. Again, I think that's why most of you have taken this class. Uh, uh, but you have to understand postmodernism. I really believe, I really believe you have to understand postmodernism to get your mind wrapped around what's happening in our culture right now in critical theory. Yeah, you have a question? Hermeneutics? <sighs> yeah. Hermeneutics is a... Um, We'll go over it next week. Hermeneutics is the uh, art and science of interpreting scripture. It's really the art and science of interpreting anything. You guys are all using hermeneutics right now by trying to interpret what I'm saying. I'll, uh, you're listening to me. You need to think about language. I've said this all the time, but it amazes me every time I think about it. I am just throwing out sounds and vibrations right now, and you guys are able to hear that and gain information. That's part of being made in the image of God, by the way. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and you're using hermeneutical principles to, to understand what I'm saying right now. And, um, and we use those same hermeneutical principles 
um, to interpret scripture. And there are certain things that we should use to interpret scripture. And, and postmodernism has attacked these hermeneutical principles. And um, it's one of the ways that affected the church. So, you know what? I think it's important. We'll, go, we'll start next week with the four ways that affected the church. And I'll explain um, hermeneutics. And then we'll jump into critical theory. Because I, I think it's important. Because, I mean, postmodernism has done a work on the church. Like, and I, I say this in all humility because I look at my own life. I can guarantee it's affected every single one of you in how you approach scripture in the church to a small level at some level. And so as we are critical about the culture that's around us, we really need to examine our own heart and go, where has this culture influenced me in my understanding of the word of God and God and truth um, and how the church should operate in, in the dogmas of the church? And, and doctrine and all these things. So we'll start there next week. So good question. Don't get me going. Oh man, I, I really need to let people go. But yes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next week a little bit. It's not. I don't think it is. I think the movement is Marxism. I don't think it's a way. I don't think people are being deceptive. For the most part, I think this is an ideology. It's a religion that people truly believe. Um, I don't think people are like, hey, let's just try to hide these, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I think people are bought into this religion um, wholeheartedly, which is even scarier than if they were trying to hide Marxism, in my opinion. Like, I think people have bought into it. Um, But again, God's in control. We can sleep well tonight. Um, The church is going to survive this. God says, um, you know, I will build my church and uh, the gates of hell will not destroy it. I'm butchering that, but you got the paraphrase, right? <laughs> like, in fact, persecution, if that comes, it's just going to strengthen us. It's just going to strengthen us, and maybe it's what we need. And so, so let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, I thank you uh, um, for this time. I thank you for everyone that's uh, taking this class, Lord. And, um, I know this is deep philosophical, um, uh, Lord, but, but we are, have been called to take thoughts captive, and we need to know what those thoughts are if we're going to do it, Lord. So, so I just pray the Spirit helps us understand these things, Lord, to see it in our own life. And I pray more than anything else, especially talking about postmodernism, that we're able to examine our hearts and, and, and ask that question, where has this affected me? Um, and so, God, I think that's extremely important. Be with us, Lord. Help us to continue to just walk forward faithfully as a church. In your Son's name, amen.